pray. Amen. All right, if you've got your Bibles this morning, I don't want to waste any time. Man, if you've got your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to Acts, and we're going to go to chapter 15 and, uh, and just look at some things. We've been in this series in Acts. God's doing mighty and powerful works all across through the history of the church. He's founded the church. In addition to, how many of you know, what God did then, He still does now, and then some. Amen. Come on, there we go. Acts chapter 15, it's a lot of reading, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read selected portions, because there's a lot of stuff going on in this chapter. Are you okay with that? Good. All right, because otherwise we're here like for 20 minutes while I read this thing to you. So Acts chapter 15, verse 1 says this, Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers that unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. So this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders and ask about this question. Skip down with me to verse 5. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. And, and if you would allow me to just what, what clarifying this, is that they're saying, the Pharisees are saying, that the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses in order to be saved. Okay? Verse 6, the apostles and elders got together or met together to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them and said, Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Verse 8, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving them or giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. Verse 9. God made no distinctions between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke? It's like the Holy Spirit knew something this morning. Why do you try to... You think we plan this? No, we don't. So let me just call Tom out from reading scripture. Let me unveil something to you. Okay? We are the most cryptic, uncommunicative staff you've ever seen in church, ever. Okay? Mondays, we have staff meeting, which consists of the four of us drinking coffee, and normally Pastor Steve leading some part of administration, while myself, Pastor Bo, and Pastor Don make fun of something. And you're like, usually, sometimes Pastor Steve, it doesn't go well. There's administrative stuff that gets done, but for the most part, we just enjoy each other's company and have a great time, and when it's serious stuff comes up, of course, we address it. But a lot of times, I don't discuss with them what this is about, which I know sometimes, if they're telling you the truth, would be absolutely frustrating. Here's the reason why. If I don't discuss with them where the Lord has taken us on Sunday morning, it requires me to get before the Lord and the Holy Spirit and have a message. Amen? That's, that's my job. Okay, is to preach this and to do so led by the Holy Spirit. Pastor Bo got a word from the Holy Spirit without knowing what this, not, where I was going. I don't want to say without knowing what this was about, but without knowing where we're going. Pastor Don picked out worship, partnered with the Holy Spirit, not knowing necessarily where we're going. Do you see that this is orchestrated by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, and that's what we want? I don't want you to come into a scripted service where there is no authenticity, where there is no move of the Holy Spirit, where we don't just call time out, do what He wants to do, because how many of you know that's the most important thing we could be doing anyway? Amen? Right. So there's a yoke. <laughs> Not the one in the egg. Amen. Now then, why do we try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved just as they are. Now, I'm gonna, you're not going to see this on the screen. I'm just going to continue reading. Don't, Devin, don't put it up. Just, we can all read for ourselves. We got it, all right? The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. Verse 13 says, when they had finished, James, and you've got to love James, 
this is the brother of Jesus who's had a revelation of Jesus post-resurrection. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers said, listen to me. Simon has described, or Peter has described to us how God has at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. Listen, the words of the prophets are in agreement with this. And he quotes, and I believe this is Amos chapter 9. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Talking about the house of Israel. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. That the remnant meant of men may seek the Lord and all of the Gentiles who bear my name says the Lord who does these things that have been known for the ages verse 19 James makes a leadership decision it is my judgment therefore that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God instead we should write to them telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols from sexual immorality from the meat of strangled animals and from blood and then in verse 21 he says for Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogue synagogues on every sabbath okay so verses 22 okay through 29 are a recap of that meeting that decision james puts those things in a letter sends it with paul and barnabas back up to antioch right so verse 30 just just jump down with me to verse 30 here don't put it up on the screen leave it alone they can read i think it the men were sent off and went to antioch and where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers. And after spending some time there, they were sent off by the brothers or by the church with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them, so to return to Jerusalem. Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch where they and many others taught and preached the power of the word. So I'm going to really quickly this morning talk about the power of the gospel okay now here's we need to understand and recognize where we're at and also that this is not the first time nor will it be the last time what I'm about to describe or what's happening and taking place is the first and only time it's happened and it's going to continue to happen especially as the Lord's day of returning comes amen okay so when I say this I want you to hear my heart and I want you to understand scripture when we talk about Christ's glorious return, this is not go hide in your homes, order extra food from Sam's, bunker up. That is not, don't know. Don't do that. Instead, it's, it's the empowerment to speak courageously and boldly this thing, even though the times are not necessarily going to reflect every Christian is going to have a great time. I would just tell you this, that season's probably over. Right? Amen. We'll just leave that there. Here's what's begun to happen, and this is inside church. Inside church, pastors and other bodies and congregations all over the world, specifically in the United States, have begun to preach Jesus and something else. I, I saw this one. I'm not going to say where. I'm not going to say who. It's not for my place to judge another servant of the Lord, and I'm, but I just know I'm not answering for that one. Amen? It was Jesus and the burning of sage. That, that's not, listen to me, not new. Some of you are like, what? It's not new. Here's what I would say like this. You don't get to incorporate Christ. It's not Jesus Christ incorporated into your life. It is Jesus Christ and Him alone, right? So if you would use, if you'd allow this analogy this morning, you gave Jesus the keys to your house. And you, when you did that, you gave Him access to every bedroom, every closet, every nook, every cranny, and even the root cellar if you want. It's your house. I don't know how many rooms or bedrooms you have in it. I, I'm good with that. Okay? You gave him the keys to the man room. You gave him the keys to the attic above the garage that no one goes in. Right? You gave him access to every dimension, every portion of your life. Not just the physical, not just the spiritual, not just the intellectual, and not just, God love you, the financial. Amen. We're not going to talk about money today. But you gave him that access too. You with me? We then come back... And we go, well, uh, um, your key doesn't work in that one. And it's almost as if 
there are times in ever in my life too. Now I'm I'm not just preaching at the choir. There are times where we we revoke his authority in areas of our life. And when we do that, we are sending him the message. Yes, you died. Yes, you resurrected. Yes, you're good, but you just didn't get it wasn't enough to cover this mess. Now, I know none of you would ever say that publicly to Jesus' face. I, me too. When we take back an area of our life, we're actually telling him, you can be Lord of all of the other stuff, but you can't be Lord of that because you don't know what's in there. Just think about that for a second. You don't know what's in there. You don't know how ugly that is, right? And, and actually, Christ, you're actually disqualified because you didn't, you didn't actually die hard enough to, to redeem this part. <laughs> you know, I didn't say that. No, you didn't say it with your words, right? How many of you know, like husbands, how many of you know, we also have actions and facial expressions that, right? So I may not have said it with my words, but I've, I said it, right? We do that. I do that. It happens. The important thing for us to know, and this is point number one, Jesus is enough. End of story. You do not need Jesus and sage. I mean, unless you just really like that as a seasoning, in that case, go for it. But you do not need to walk around burning sage in your house in order to cast out evil spirits or ward off evil demonic stuff. Jesus is enough. The, the Bible clearly says one may put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand. Look, I'm standing by, I'm a single mom, I'm at home, I just have the kids. It's you and Jesus, and Jesus is enough. Come on. Jesus died on the cross. And that is enough for salvation. Period. And I'm going to prove it to you this morning. It's enough for total and complete freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from the law. Right? Let me say it like this. Freedom from all of the performance-based relationship stuff and junk that we have ever heard and taken in and said, you know, God, you can't go in this room because I haven't been to church enough. Now, before you go, before I'm going to make a statement, but and before you go, I'm going to write that down. It'll be on YouTube, I'm sure, and I'll be a her heretic by 3 p.m. Just understand something. Going to church is not what keeps you saved. It's what keeps you in fellowship in ecclesia with the body. Which Hebrews 10 clearly says, don't forsake the gathering together of yourselves with other believers. Capiche? You got it? You didn't know we were going to get a lingo lesson too, did you? right? So understand something. I want you in church. Do you have to go to 970 church? No, but go to a church. Well, I can just go to any church. Well, I, uh, if they're preaching Jesus and sage, that's off the market. No, 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 no. If they're preaching Jesus and something else, don't go there. It's Jesus alone. Let's get the scripture. So I back this up. Galatians chapter two, Devin's got it for us. Galatians chapter two, four and five starts with this. This matter arose, by the way, this is Paul speaking to the church in the region where he's currently at. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on, what's that word? Freedom. Can you underline that in your Bible for me or highlight that in your app? To spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. Can you stop right there? No, go back. Go, there we go. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ. In other words, it's not solely about all the rules that you've ever been told about. Can I say it like this? And I, I've, we've talked about this over the last couple of weeks. Holiness is not a byproduct of performance. Holiness is not a byproduct of following the rules. Jesus did not come and die on the cross so that we would be better at following the rules. So all of you people who are left-handed, born in a right-handed world, 
there's freedom, right? I don't have to fit. I don't have to conform. I have the freedom to be me submitted to Christ. And you still have to obey the speed limit. Obey all civil authorities. That's in here. In the, just so you know, in the New Testament, it is not a speed suggestion. It is a speed limit. Only in Montana is it actually suggested. And since we live in Colorado, right, it says obey the laws, obey the civil authorities, understand submitted one to another and submitted to Christ. There's free, I know that this sounds totally, totally uh, another word, but let's just say this doesn't sound like it would make sense. There is freedom in submitting to Jesus Christ. Heart, mind, soul, the whole thing. Galatians chapter 5, I'm not necessarily reading it this morning, don't put it up, but it says, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. It means there's a freedom in following Christ. So much so that they're looking at it because the culture at the time has been so much about performance. And I would say it like this, about following the law. And James says it and Peter says it, guys, our forefathers couldn't live up to it. And they were living with God, seeing him in a tangible sense. Go, what do you, go back, Old Testament, their forefathers, he's referring to the children of Israel coming out of uh, Egypt, I almost said England, wrong one, coming out of Egypt, wrong E country, okay, coming out of Egypt, and the Lord inhabited a tent and led them by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire by night. He wa they watched him perform ten plagues, separate the Red Sea, provide water from a rock and manna and quail and the whole nine yards. And the Bible says, and they still couldn't live up to following all of the law. Why would we place on the Gentiles a yoke or a burden that we ourselves or our forefathers could follow? And yet at the same time, they go on to say, we're not going to place a yoke of burden on them that we couldn't follow. We're just simply saying there is freedom in Jesus. So we're going to make it easy for them to walk in the grace that God has provided all of us. Okay. Galatians chapter 4, let's, uh, we kill that one, Galatians 5, four, chapter 2, verse 4, sorry, Galatians 2, verse 4 and 5, <laughs> we did verse 4, <laughs> we did not give in to them for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you, right, skip down with me to verse 15 and 16. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles, eh, the Passion Translation does that better, but know that a person is not, watched justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because the works of the law, no one will be justified. Jesus alone is enough. I like what Jesus put it in his own words. John chapter 14, verse 6. This is his, in his upper room discourse. John gives us the most language and dialogue out of it. Jesus answered, and this is specifically to Philip. He said, I am the way. This is Christ's own words. I'm the way. I'm the truth. And I am the life. Watch, this is very, this is, this will make people mad on social media. This last part of this verse. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. No one comes to the Father except through faith in the Son. No one comes to the Father except Jesus and, no. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. Done. End of story. You go, well, Pastor, you don't know what I'm facing. And, and maybe there is some spiritual warfare that's going on. And I would just tell you this. If you're having and experiencing night terrors, sage is going to do the opposite thing of what you believe it's going to do. Because here's the thing. And I, I, we did ministry on Native American reservations for two years. And I will tell you right now, sage actually busts the door wide open for the enemy to come 
wallowing through. And here's why. Because you put your faith in the sage and not in Jesus. Never in Scripture does it say you will not have to face the enemy. It doesn't say that. Just, just so we're clear. Right? And, and <laughs> some of you are like, oh, that's the first time I've ever heard of that. But, okay, well, good. I'm glad you heard it in church. I also want to tell you this for some of you that are warriors, dads, fathers, da- ladies, Father's Day coming. She's like, I know I've had to done since February. I get you. Father's Day is coming, and here's what I want to challenge you with, and I want to challenge us with it. There's still a time for warriors. Masculinity is not toxic. It was created by the Father. All right, anyway, I'm going to stop just preaching different messages. I'm just going to touch... Now, it's what we do with our masculinity that honors God. And here's the thing. We're still called to be the defender of our home. And you know what? It's not you by yourself. It's not you with your AK-47 or your M4 or your shotgun. It's not you and Remington or you and Benelli. It's you and Jesus. And Remington and Benelli are on call. Amen. <laughs> okay? I, my email is at Pastor Steve. At 970.church. Just, just go ahead and put those in there and he will get them back to you as soon as he can. What I want us to understand is this. Jesus is enough. And if you're experiencing spiritual warfare, you don't need sage. And I'll be honest with you. You don't need me to come to your house and pray for you. I will. Now I'm bringing heaven with me. If you have a relationship, and I've even seen this work with people who are pre-believers. If you would allow the term... They are pre-believers, and they use the name of Jesus, and they see evidence of like, oh, this is, and and you want to go, um, so here's the thing. Now that you've just used this name, it's probably good that you should have a relationship with the one whose name you used. Otherwise, what you're experiencing right now before up until this point, it's coming back, and it may not be alone. Some of you are like, what's going on? If you've ever had night terrors, there's like a yoke of oppression that is literally pressing you in to where am I describing anything don't you don't have to you don't have to acknowledge it's me i already know you're experiencing being oppressed or like there is a 1000 pound weighted blanket that just feels not holy and you're probably feeling some level of strangulation strang- strangling it's happening or you feel like you've got something on your throat that's actually locking your throat or vocal cords down and you can only whisper at best but in your night terror it sounds like you are trying to scream at the top of your lungs that's not natural that's what we call supernatural and the problem is you're experiencing the dark side of the supernatural now it doesn't mean it came through sin It doesn't mean it came through an open door. I don't know how it got there, but I know this. Sage is not going to save you. Jesus is the only one. And if you can whisper Jesus, and I know this because it is from personal experience. Early on when when we moved here, we were living in in a rented house, and we were just going about life. And if you've heard this story before, I just beg your indulgence. I know that there are those who haven't, and or those of you that have, and you need to be reminded of it. There was a, we were going through some spiritual warfare because we had come from one place, now we're here, some things had gotten stirred up, and we totally moved here by faith. And in doing so, how many of you know when you start living your life by faith, there is an equal and opposite reaction from the enemy? And so I was having, not weekly, but like sometimes nightly visitations from something that had no authority to be in my house okay and so during that time and it was probably it was probably about a month there were dreams of me losing my family specifically that one of uh one of our kids was dying um there was one that one night i woke up and there was a skeleton standing on the edge of my bed reaching for my wife's foot you know, it's not the time to go burn some sage. It's, it's not the time to go turn on some f- form of praise and worship music and blast. It's, no, 
The enemy's already at your door. As a matter of fact, the enemy's already through your door. And Jesus is enough. There were times I've been pressed into the bed. Right? A weight. And not like a thousand pound warm blanket weight of His glory kind of thing. That would have been nice. And that wasn't what it was. It was cold and almost a void pressing down and in. And the only thing that would remove and get that off was the name Jesus. And then when I woke, and I say woke up, when I realized what was happening, because they were tormenting dreams. You, how many of you sit up in bed and go, what's in this room? Right? And a lot of times, I saw what was in the room. And then, oh no, it's not the time to reach for Benelli. It's not the time for Lord Remington to make an appearance. It's time for you and Jesus to go through the house at that point, chasing every little skittering thing and go, uh uh-uh, no, we ain't shutting, we're shutting all these doors. We're not tolerating this. Fathers, that's still our job with children living underneath our homes, roofs. That's still our job even though they're not living at home. Amen? Maybe you have grown adult children. Maybe they're living in another country. I plead the precious blood of Jesus over them right now. All right, enough of that. We've beat that to death. Good job. Number two. His grace set us free. Number one is Jesus is enough. Number two, His grace set us free. Acts chapter 15, 9 through 11 uh, is... is just, wait, I read it to you a little bit early, but let me just... Let me go back and rehash it here. For Jesus made no distinction, or God made no distinction between us and them, speaking of the Gentiles. For He purified the Gentiles' hearts by faith. Now then, why do we try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear. Verse 11, does that say no? And that is an exclamation point in your Bible. No. We believe it is through, watch, the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. What there are and we oftentimes call this in, in church history or church circles, this is the first counselor of the council at Jerusalem. This has a lot of, this is a big historical moment in the life of the church. And it's really important that they arrive at this conclusion and it's significant to every believer to understand this thing. We believe it is through grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we're saved. Okay? It's faith in Him. Done so by grace. Now, His grace set us free. Set us free from what? That's a really great question and I hope you're asking that right now. Set us free from what? Well, the first thing I want to tell us, I want to reveal to us that the Bible says it this morning, we are free from sin. If you want to pull up Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, it says this. In Jesus, okay, in Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's... What does that say? Okay, let me... Now, now that you know where I'm going to ask you about it, let's do it again. In Him, in Jesus... We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. We are free from sin. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 read like this. For it's by grace we have been saved through faith, and this not from ourselves, for it is the gift of God. And then verse 9 says, not by works, so that no one can boast. It's by grace that we've been saved through faith in Christ. We are free. Free from what? Free from sin. There's a whole chapter Paul wrote about it called Romans chapter 6. If you've never read Romans chapter 6, let me just, I know, Devin, don't get mad. Just stay right there with me. Romans chapter 6. Let me read this to you. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were also baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we've been united... I'm going to just... I've got to stop because I'll read the whole chapter and that, that will just kidnap the entire morning. Romans chapter 6 is the most powerful chapter in my opinion in the book of Romans and in most of the New Testament and here's why. Because it's freedom from sin. Freedom from the law. Freedom from 
from our old self. You're no longer a zombie coat. So you're like, what does that mean? You're, you're wearing a dead man. You're not wearing a dead man. You're, you, if you've seen the movie Men in Black, you kind of know what I'm talking about, where the, the cockroach puts on an Edgar suit. Don't do that. It's smelly and stinky. You're a rotting corpse when you try to live from your old life. And here's the thing. The church has not done you any favors. All right, now let, let's, i got to be real. For years, we have taught from the pulpit you need to perform in order that Jesus would love you more. Not true. I'm just telling you right now. It's not true. We allowed a spirit of religion, which is funny. Let me just give you an ironic thing. Jesus came, and in one of the things that he accomplished was to end all religions. But because we didn't teach new life correctly, do you know what Christianity became the mother of? The mother of all religions. When you and I said yes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, beloved, done. Done. Set free from sin. Set free from the law. Okay? Set free from self. Done. Now, there's a lot of other things we can pull into context, but we don't have time. Not this morning. Freedom from sin. We proved that one here. Let's go freedom from the law. Galatians chapter 3, 10 through 14 said this. For all who rely on works of the law. Can I, can, if you would in parentheses just write this. For all who would rely on religion or works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous, what does it say? Will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will, the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hung on a pole or hung on a tree, depending on what translation. He said he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Let me unpack that for us for just a second. Jesus died so that we might be free from 613 laws that the Jews couldn't follow anyway because it says so right there. And they're going, we don't want to put that burden. We, our forefathers couldn't follow that burden. There's no way the Gentiles are going to follow that burden. Don't you love it when they sell you short? Amen. Right? And they're going, we couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. This is a yoke, and it's by grace that they've been saved. Done. Paul would go on specifically to address this region of Galatia in the book of Galatians and clarify that point. That's why we use that as one of our key texts this morning. You're free from the law, so don't let anybody come back and tell you it is Jesus plus that makes you free. Does this make sense? Are there still things you and I have to work out in context of relationship with Christ? Yes. Here's the problem. We put the onus of what's right and wrong on the church and not on the voice of the Father. Here's what I mean. Is watching and do not email anyone on this one. I don't care what happens. Just understand this. If you listened to music that did is not worship, we'll just classify that, okay? On the way to church this morning, I remember a point in time where if someone found out what you listened to and it wasn't K-Love or Airwave or whatever the new Christian radio station is that's going on, they were ready to crucify you in the public square. If they found out you saw a movie that might have a, a notion or a euphemism of a cuss word. I remember we attended a church where the pastor stood up and said, I went to the movie theater and I watched Terminator 2. 
right? And some of you are like, wait, it goes back that far? Yes. <laughs> some of you are wondering, what's a Terminator? It, it's this dangerous place we're heading right now with AI <laughs> where all the machines come to life. It's not good. It didn't work out for them then. It won't work out for us. I'm just kidding. What I want us to understand is this. We've, we did two things. We said it's the church's moral obligation to tell you what was right and wrong. Instead of letting you work out and us work out our conviction and our salvation with the voice of the Father. A friend of mine just had this experience happen. They, they got together and they, they were actually able, and I, I know I say able as if it's in their ability. The Lord drew some hearts to himself and they completely surrendered their entire life but they were consulting witchcraft in order to determine their future. And I don't mean like they read a horoscope, even though, mm, ladies, that count. Guys, horoscopes count. Don't do that. But they were actually consulting a spirit, okay, in order to determine their future, and they just got saved. Now, they went to him, my friend, and they said, hey, is it okay if we still use this instrument in order to know what God would have us do. And he said, and this is a miracle in and of itself, because you have to know my friend for this, and I don't, I'm just protecting identities. Okay, you have to know my friend, he shut his mouth. He said, the Holy Spirit put a clothespin over my lips. And I'm like, praise Jesus, it can happen. And he said this. He waited in silence for just a few seconds, and he said, What's the Father telling you about the answer to this question? And then stood there, obviously in tension, waiting for, Lord, this is your child too. I'm not the mouthpiece this time. You've got you to speak to her, right? And you know what God did? Revealed to this lady, oh my gosh. This is totally wrong because I am putting my faith and my hope and trust for my future in this thing that's not the Lord in order to hear from Him. And where we would have gone, here's, here's what the majority of us would have done. We would have said, no, that's witchcraft. Yes, that's the truth. Yes, that is a correct answer. But that answer devoids the revelation of relationship with the Father. The Jewish sin is an affront to the Father, not because we did it wrong. That's what the church taught. Here's what I want you to understand. Sin is an affront to the Father because it separated us relationally. The wholeness that we have with Him now has a hole in it and is quickly, quickly leaking if you would allow that analogy it has interrupted the relational wholeness with the Father that's what sin is are you okay? and Jesus died on the cross not so that we would be better at following the rules because how many of you have been perfect since you followed the just put every, no hands went up and my hand quickly went down so if Jesus died on the cross to make us better rule followers he already failed whoa no Jesus died on the cross to set us free from sin to set us free from the law and to restore relational wholeness with the father through him and that's free and then I can continue to work out my salvation according to Paul and according to the scriptures upon my relationship. And the Bible specifically says with the fear of the Lord and the trembling of his word. We did a sermon, I did a sermon on the fear of the Lord a couple months ago, probably a month and a half ago. And it ties very well with Acts because the fear of the Lord is present in the book of, the, in the book of Acts, specifically with the Holy Spirit and the new church. Amen? Okay, go back and listen to it. That's a shameful plug for 970.church. Okay, last one. I have nine minutes. 
Challenge accepted. Jesus is enough. Number two, his grace sets us free. Sets us free from sin. Sets us free from the law. Number three, we are empowered by the revelation of the number one and number two to leave a former way of life behind. Before I expound on this, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 15, verse 19 and 20. Devin's going to pull them up for us. We're going to read them off in as rapid fashion as I possibly can. He said, therefore, this is James speaking, it is my judgment that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. For we know that our old self or selves was crucified with Christ so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. He's talking about water baptism in the near as well. And then 11 through 14, in, this is Romans chapter 6, 11 through 14. In the same way, watch, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in or through Christ Jesus. Verse 12, therefore don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Verse 14, for sin, so let's say it like this, for relational disruption shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under what? Grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ or is in right relationship with Christ, or let's just say it like this, is in relationship with Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Galatians chapter 2, 19 and 20. For, though the law, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 5. As for you, you are dead in your transgression and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and th thoughts. Like the rest, we were, were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of His great love, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. For it is by grace that we have been saved. Colossians chapter 2, 21 and 23. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are destined to perish with us, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Uh-oh. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value of restraining sensual indulgence. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, The Lord knows those who are His, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Here's what I want you to know. This is what he issues. He says, stay away from these four things. Right? Let me just go back. Let me make sure we got these four things and what they are. We don't want to make it difficult. Acts chapter 5, verse 19. Difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them, abstain from food polluted by idols. Abstain from sexual immorality. Abstain from the meat of strangled animals and from blood. Do you know why he gave those four issues and commands? Because all of those four commands were tied to their former ways of worshiping, not God. When he says, and I'll just break them down really quick. Ooh, really quick. Abstain from food polluted by idols. What it means is this. is When you would go, and when you were, when you were coming out of pagan worship, you would go and you would make food offerings to this God. Does that make sense? So he goes, don't eat or even don't, even, don't even lay grapes at the feet. Just leave it alone. You don't do that anymore. Because it's a form of worship that they used to be 
uh, in touch with. He says, flee from sexual immorality. The way that this, yes, that's true, that's important. It also applies to how they were worshiping at the temple because it was temple prostitution. And he says, he's going, no, you don't worship that way and you definitely are not worshiping that God that way. That's not where we go, okay? He says, from the meat of strangled from the meat of strangled animals. It wasn't another. It wasn't kosher, but it was also animals that were offered to these gods, and they would oftentimes be burned, or there would be a sacrifice. Here's what I want to tell you: Doesn't this sound like Old Testament in a little bit? Okay, the devil doesn't create; he can only emulate. In other words, he's ripping off Old Testament covenant worship, and has applied it to the pagan customs, and he's telling them. You have left, in other words, le- you're saved by faith because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to leave your former way of worshiping or what you formerly worshipped because you have a new life now. So here's what I want us to know. There's a lot of things sometimes that we're told to abstain from because it has the appearance of holiness. Following the rules doesn't make you holy. What makes us holy and where holiness is a... I I have to stop. Holiness is a natural outcome of relationship with the Son that restores us to relational wholeness. Father. Some of us need to take the burden off. It's a yoke of religion that we that that mistakenly sometimes we've called and mis- and not understood or recognized. That's actually not relationship. Jesus said it like this: "And my yoke is easy, and my burden is light." It's, it's, it's us meant to be yoked to Him and Him alone. Does that mean like divorce your spouse and only... No, it's not what I'm saying. It has to be said this way. Kate and I have a great relationship. We, we work on our marriage all the time. I'm not responsible for her relationship with Christ. She is, not, she is not responsible for her relationship or my relationship with Him now. We, we have to own our relationship independent of one another in order for this thing to work. And this, this is an analogy I use in marriage, marital counseling all the time. So picture yourself a triangle, right? Give yourself a triangle. Put Jesus at the top. Put you and your spouse on the other end of the bottom. If you only focus on growing together, yes, you'll have a strong marriage, but Jesus has been left out. Does this make sense? If I focus on Christ, what happens? We both start to go up to the peg, and then we we get a relationship with Christ closer, and because of that, we come closer as well. Why are you going there? I don't know. Somebody's marriages need, some marriages just need a touch. They need a healing need a moment with the Lord. Let's not forget you. Let's not forget marriages. They're important. Let me bow you. I I would invite you to bow your head and close your eyes this morning because here's the thing. Man, Pastor Bo had the word, didn't he? He heard from the Lord and it's a yoke. And sometimes we mistake a yoke of religion for being yoked to the Lord, to Jesus. There's a scripture, it's very powerful, it's in Isaiah. It says the Holy Spirit breaks the yoke of bondage. And some of us have been living in bondage. You could even read it in the in the scroll of Isaiah or the book of Isaiah. It says, There is a spirit of heaviness. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now. I 
pray that the Holy Spirit would break off the yoke of bondage, religion. Because Father, you didn't die on the cross so that we would be better at following the rules, nor did you die on the cross and tell us to live a, a lawless life. You died on the cross to restore our relational wholeness with the Father. And that through that restoration and us having a revelation of that restoration and walking in relationship with you, that we would experience the ultimate freedom. Set free from sin. Set free from performance. Set free from religion set free from our former way of life and invited to discover a new life with you. And we say yes to that, Jesus. Father, we bless what you're doing right here at 970 Church. We bless every person that's going to watch online or is watching online right now. Lord, we pray for them. Isaiah chapter 40. Lord, that you would make the crooked path straight and that you would bring the high place low and bring the low place up so that your glory might be revealed through your children on the earth. We love you. We bless you. We bless 970 Church. And it's in your holy and precious name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hey, man, we love you. We're so glad that you're here with us. If you don't have or you're not connected to a small group, we're going to have a couple opportunities here in the next few weeks to get connected to small groups, get connected to small group leadership um, so you can just continue to meet and get discipled and grow deeper in our relationship with God and in our spiritual community with one another. That's the last announcement I have for you this morning. We love you. We bless you. We will see you.